Everywhere you look, the whole world is in the midst of a thrilling transit revolution. Thanks to Hyperloop, traveling from city to city is faster and flashier than ever, practically rendering planes obsolete. Getting around town also couldn't be easier, thanks to the boring company's ubiquitous tunnel networks. And you can always spread your wings and hop in an autonomous electric flying vehicle if you're really in a rush. Wait, we can't do any of those things? This is the world we should be living in according to transit plans drawn up by tech's brightest minds. But this is what these projects look like in real life when they're finished. Gimmicks for the few, while the rest of us are still stuck in traffic. So why do these tech companies want to change transit? And why are their solutions so often a letdown? Transportation issues are nothing new. If you think of just the modes of transportation throughout history, just going from um, you know horse and buggy to rail, uh, to ocean-going vessels, steam liners, uh, airships. <laughs> um, there's always been something new uh, to try out that would solve some of the problems of the old. Juan Matute researches transit and urban planning at UCLA. And each one of those new things has introduced its own uh, new problems. Today's transportation mix is no exception. The biggest problem is that roughly a quarter of global energy-related carbon emissions are linked to transport, but that's just one of many. So there are a lot of problems with how people get around, right? Paris Marx writes about technology, including a book about Silicon Valley and transportation. You know, many people have the experience of being stuck in traffic, and of course people don't like that. Um, there's also the high cost of kind of owning a vehicle if you have to do that in order to get around. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in many places, transit services are not always the most uh, accessible, the most efficient, uh, even the most affordable. While accessibility and climate might sound important, our tech savior's focus is elsewhere. This, but this fundamentally is what we're trying to solve. You'll, you've, we've all been there many, many times. We must solve, solve, solve the soul-destroying traffic situation. Traffic jams are so universally hated that they're the butt of jokes in movies. All these issues mean there's certainly plenty of room for improvement. Little wonder that tech giants jumped onto the transit bandwagon. Big tech has reshaped the economy and flashy, hype-fueled presentation, no matter what their substance, were key. Just because Silicon Valley and because the tech industry has been so ascendant for the past decade or two, there is a real desire to see these companies uh, address these problems. And so instead of kind of really mundane things like invest in buses and, uh, you know, think about how we uh, distribute street space and maybe make some cycle lanes, it sounds a lot more attractive to say, oh, the cars are going to start driving themselves and we're going to make this new tunnel system for transportation and we're going to have flying cars finally. Investors in media lapped up high-tech, exciting new transit projects, and the company saw potential too. People spend loads on transit. In the US, for instance, 16% of household spending goes to transportation, second only to housing. It's a major part of the economy. So when you look at the total addressable market for uh, transportation innovation, it looks huge. It's it's much bigger than uh, like a, a dating app or you know, a new way to find a, a hotel room in a city. Um, and so that can be very attractive. And while investors currently only have promises, not results to go on, it hasn't stopped them. For example, Elon Musk's The Boring Company, named that because they bore tunnels, get it, picked up $675 million in private capital in 2022. Local governments have also jumped on board, Musk announced deals promising to build underground tunnels for high-speed travel in Chicago and Fort Lauderdale in 2018 and 2021. Neither have been built. Tech firms see that many regions and cities lack adequate public transit and have moved in. In places where cities are still growing and there's rapid urbanization, um, you can use shared mobility as a way of as a transitionary service and um, as a way of filling gaps in the, in the infrastructure. 
Part of the appeal these projects have for local governments is that private, tech-based solutions could help avoid fierce political debates and heavy spending usually needed for infrastructure. These problems would require us to have some difficult conversations about how we, you know, distribute resources right now, how we, uh, you know, how we distribute road space, uh, you know, the types of investments we want to make in automobiles versus transit versus cycling, you know, all these difficult questions. If tech can solve all our problems, we can just bypass the endless political debates, especially convenient in these gridlocked, polarized times. So the hype train is rolling, the venture capital is flowing, everything's fine and dandy till tech companies have to deliver on their spectacular promises. One of the most glaring examples is Hyperloop, a high-speed, above-ground vacuum tube popularized by Musk in 2013 and pursued by a number of firms. Billionaire Richard Branson, owner of Virgin, also got in on the fun. Anything that um, can transport people with clean energy fast, efficiently, safely, is critical right now. And Virgin Hyperloop fits all the criteria you could possibly want. In 2017, Virgin Hyperloop announced plans to build overground vacuum tubes that would hurdle people at 670 miles an hour across the US, India, and the Middle East. But the closest these came to materializing was a single crude test in 2020, which reached about 100 miles an hour, far less than promised. Costs were nearly 10 times higher, and the test ride transported just two passengers instead of the promised 28. In fact, Branson recently removed the name Virgin from the Hyperloop company he'd invested in, not a ringing endorsement. But even with all this disappointment, Branson's company came closest to the initial promises. Musk has pretty much abandoned the idea. And even if the technology worked, before Hyperloop takes over California at least, it will have to clear a major hurdle, as demonstrated by the state's never-ending high-speed rail project. The high-speed rail project has had an immense challenge with access to land and land acquisition in spite of government's authority. Um, and to do a privately sponsored project that had some level of controversy uh, and didn't have access to uh, the government's um, eminent domain authority would be prohibitively difficult. Undeterred by the failure of his above-ground travel project, Musk opted to go underground with his boring company. First, he pledged to dig elaborate systems of tunnels under cities where autonomously driven pods with 16 passengers would zip around with ease. That became a pledge to develop a system of so-called skates, which would sweep electric cars across town at speeds of up to 130 miles an hour, which became a one-way tunnel to drive Teslas through at about 40 miles an hour, called the Loop, which at least exists. He sold these systems to a bunch of uh, cities around the United States, and in most cases, they have not materialized. And in the only place where, where it has, which is Las Vegas, it's a short tunnel that connects up the convention center and is mainly just an, an attraction for Teslas. You know, it's a way to sell Teslas. It's not really affecting traffic. It's not really solving transportation problems. It's really, I call it a Disneyland ride for Tesla fans. Yet another familiar failure to deliver. The cars in the loop aren't even self-driving. While Las Vegas has approved plans to expand the loop, the project has yet to deliver Musk victory in his personal vendetta against traffic. Western billionaires aren't the only ones with tech that sounds more impressive than it looks. China's autonomous rail rapid transit has gotten hyped for being a cheaper alternative to standard trams and has been tested in Qatar and Australia. It's a quote-unquote trackless tram system that traverses roads and has a driver, despite being called autonomous. That's right, pretty much a bus. Looks kinda cool, but not a transit revolution. If it feels like we're seeing a pattern here, it's because lots of these could be defined as gadget bonds, the transit term for an exciting new technology that's actually less useful than what it's meant to replace. Some tech companies have gone beyond essentially reinventing buses and simply made buses. In Egypt and India, Uber has folded existing ubiquitous modes of transport, like rickshaws and minibuses, into their app infrastructure. Services don't really replace things that already exist. They enter into a market where minibuses are very common. What you can see it as is a private transportation service that offers a kind of 
um, more expensive and kind of higher quality of service to a certain select group of customers. Much of the planet already gets around via minibus. Nothing wrong with entering that market, but hard to call it something new. And then there is the holy grail of sci-fi, flying cars. Some companies like Joby are working on what they call electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles or flying taxis. Even the biggest Luddites have to admit that these are cool, though they look more like fancy helicopters than flying cars. Joby hopes to launch these fully electric vehicles in 2025. They should have a range of 150 miles, but Joby expects the average trip to be around 25, meaning flying taxis would complement, not replace existing transport networks. Even if they do arrive according to plan, they're unlikely to have an immediate impact on emissions or traffic. Plus, it's safe to assume that hovering cabs might cost a tad more to get you to the airport than a bus. If and when these tech solutions materialize, they often bring with them their own set of regulatory cost and safety challenges, or fail to solve some of the biggest transit issues. And even if some of these projects are green on paper, they won't impact human-induced climate change if they don't exist. Ideally, mass transit should serve the masses. That means recognizing it as a public good, something flashy private innovation distracts from. If we wanted to do it, we could have been making investments in transit service and investments in cycling infrastructure and doing you know, other things in order to address these issues instead of waiting for the tech industry to create solutions that were never actually going to solve anything in the first place. Practical transit solutions that encourage people to ditch private cars are often a bit boring. While the electric buses popping up all over the world are cool, they are no flying cars. And transit researchers might be the only people on the planet who think e-bikes are sexy. I have one right here in the background. It's how I get it to work. Um, they're pretty understated. They're easy to maintain, low cost. They enable uh, quicker and longer bike trips without the cost of showing up sweaty <laughs> or tired. Bikes and buses are great local transit solutions. But what makes them really shine is dedicated lanes, like Bogota's bus expressways or Amsterdam's extensive network of bike paths. And there's always room for innovation, like in Medellin, where cable cars help traverse densely built, steep terrain. All of these, as well as more elaborate trams and metro systems, require public spending and planning. Which is another reason we've shied away from real solutions. Infrastructure isn't just boring, it's expensive. That's doubly so for environmentally friendly intercity transportation. Dense high-speed rail networks exist in Asia and Europe, but expanding these networks into regions where they don't yet exist and ensuring they're affordable and accessible is a costly proposition that only a state can afford to take on. Having to do that is that these are not technological issues, right? These are ultimately political problems. So it'll take much more than flashy animations to solve our traffic problems, let alone curb transit's climate impact. The billions in venture capital and heaps of attention these tech solutions garner would probably be better invested in truly boring, but more efficient, real solutions. Let us know which transit technology you see having the biggest impact on climate change in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe, we get a new video every Friday.